All right. Um, hi, everyone. Happy to be here in this virtual uh, SMB spin off symposium. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about natural selection in the Arabidopsis genome in, in present and future climates. In this talk, I am <clears throat> excuse me, I am addressing three questions related to environmental driven natural selection to give you an overview of different topics that we work on and generate some diverse discussion later. So the questions that I'm going to try to address are how strong, variable and predictable is allelic natural selection across climates? What is the architecture of absolute fitness? And what are the phenotypes under selection, even if we cannot measure them? Let me first present you the experiments we conducted to address these questions. We conducted so-called common garden experiments with 500 wild type accessions or strains from Arabidopsis thaliana planted in two locations, Spain in the warm edge of the distribution and Germany the, at the center of the geographic distribution. And these genetically distinct accessions come from many regions in the world um, and potentially might be might have locally adapted to those conditions. So in fall, we sowed seeds in pots inside this foil tunnel. This is the example from Germany and an identical one was in Spain. So we could replicate a Spanish rainfall and a German rainfall for half of the replicates inside of the tunnel. This allowed us to separate rainfall effects from location effects such as temperature and for the period. At the end of spring, when they flowered, I quantified survivorship and offspring production of 25,000 pots with growing plants in different manipulated environments. And you can see the distributions of fitness in these different environmental combinations. The most natural environments are, of course, Spain and low precipitation. As you can see, many fitness values are close to zero in Germany and high rainfall. And these are the two environments that I'm going to be discussing mostly today. So to quantify natural selection at the genetic level, I can calculate marginally the association between reference and alternative allele states for individuals at position in the genome I with their relative fitness, the individual's relative fitness, and iterated over 1.3 million SNPs. The resulting total selection coefficient S um, captures both direct and indirect selection. And in the case of a self-fertilizing species and this inbred lines that we're using, uh, we can use the selection coefficient S to predict or estimate the expected frequency change in a single generation after selection. So in these Manhattan plots, I am showing the significance of the selection coefficients to be different from zero for all the SNPs in the genome across the five chromosomes. And in red, we have the SNPs that pass the Bonferroni threshold. We see in Spain and low rainfall, over 6,000 SNPs passing the Bonferroni threshold all over the genome. So selection is highly polygenic. We find that the top SNPs change as much as 25% using the equation above. So selection is highly polygenic and is dragging our frequencies genome-wide. In Germany and high end rainfall, the architecture seemed also polygenic. We had over 150 the SNPs distributed across the five chromosomes. Although the smaller fitness differences, no genotype uh, died completely in this experiment, uh, made selection much weaker. Uh, so allo frequencies changed up to 2.6%. So we've seen that selection strength in Spain is uh, of a higher magnitude than in Germany. But was selection over the same alleles over the same snakes, what alleles were selected in each environment. I want to analyze this visually and let the data speak by itself. So here we have plots, oops, sorry. We have plots where um, one allele is one dot in the genome and they're plotted based on the annual precipitation in the x-axis and precipitation seasonality in the y-axis of the geographic origin of the alleles found in the 
1001 uh, genomes geographic coordinates. I indicate with a big black dot the average precipitation of the uh, location where we did the Spanish experiment. And then I color coded in green those alleles that were positively selected in Spain, so they would increase in frequency after selection, and the red alleles that were negatively selected. We can see that alleles closer in environment to uh, the Spanish experiment were positively selected, and they were more negatively selected as they come from more different climates, suggesting that climate has already enriched um, four alleles that are positively selected or that have positive fitness contributions where they're found. And we see the mirror image in Germany, alleles that come from higher precipitation environments were typically more selected in positively selected in Germany. As expected by these spatially varying selection that trades off, uh, we find that the alleles that have a higher on average absolute selection coefficient had a higher FST when we calculate this FST between populations such as the natural populations in Germany and Spain. So from the previous examples, it seems that past patterns of local selection are predictable based on some imperfect local adaptation equilibrium. So we were wondering if we could create quantitative models, forecasting models, of what will be the natural selection under future climates. So we tried to fit this function where the selection coefficients measured in the field experiments were predicted by the climate of the field experiment, the alleles climate of origin, and selection signatures such as FST. And using random forest, it seemed that um, under cross-validation, we captured a good amount of the variance. In a second step, we then tried to predict what are the alleles that will be positively and negatively selected in natural populations of Arabidopsis, all these dots that you see in the map. And we use this by fitting it to the fitted model, the present climates and the future climates predicted by the IPCC and compare those. In this way, we could measure whether the local alleles of all the accessions, all the strains that we have sequenced, right, and we know their genomes, whether the local alleles will be more negatively selected in the future. And what this will indicate, as you see in this population scene red, is that the local alleles will be less fitted in the future. They, uh, the change in climate might create maladaptation. Of course, this is a relative metric. It might tell us relative risks of local extinction of populations, but is uh, not a realization of the, uh, or a prediction of the extinction of populations, as that would require us to model this demographically. Okay, so that was a lot to digest, but we can uh, ask or we can discuss questions later. Now I want to uh, discuss two unpublished follow-ups for discussion. The, the first is, what is the true genetic architecture of absolute fitness? So we've seen by conducting genome-wide associations in these uh, fitness datasets from Spain and Germany, that selection is highly polygenic. But we saw sometimes very skewed fitness distributions, which made us wonder, are those genotypes that have uh, much higher fitness, are in the fitness scale, do they experience some type of positive epistasis? But the problem is that current genome-wide association techniques assume that the traits are additive. So essentially they assume that as we increase the number of positive mutations, lifetime fitness increases linearly. And this is typically justified as it is a good statistical approximation to the infinitesimal model. But much population genetics actually assumes or has the default model that selection is multiplicative. So that means that as you increase the number of positive mutations in your genome, lifetime fitness actually increases geometrically. And further population genetic theory invokes other types of global epistasis such as synergistic effects of multiple mutations or diminishing returns to try to explain the mutational load of a species or even the evolution of recombination. So we wanted 
to study the architecture of fitness in these experimental populations, but we didn't have a model. So we developed a fitness genome-wide association model for which we could test additive and non-additive functions. We developed a likelihood framework tailored for fitness data, uh, where we assume that there is some zero inflation as there's typically lots of zeros in fitness data sets. And the fitness of each genotype would come from or would be drawn from a normal distribution with a true uh, fitness, underlying fitness that is unobserved. And this fitness comes from the sum of direct effects and fitness of mutations genome-wide or the multiplication, as you can see here. We also allow these functions to vary in shape by having a hyperparameter E. Using likelihood optimization, we can fit these different models to the same uh, fitness data set and see which one best fits or predicts the data. So we did this with eight Arabidopsis experiments. What we see is that our model in black for additive, uh, an additive model or multiplicative for uh, yellow for the multiplicative predicts typically much better than state-of-the-art genome-wide association techniques such as the Bayesian stars linear mix model. You see that sometimes in some experiments it just doesn't learn anything. We can focus for a second on the experiment that we're most familiar with today, which is Spain and low rainfall, where if we try to predict the experimental fitness under cross-validation, we see that our model does pretty well as permanent correlation coefficient of 0.5 compared under the multiplicative model compared to an additive model or the state-of-the-art GWAS. So we've seen that if we create a tailored genome-wide association of fitness that allows a multiplicative architecture, that we might increase our ability to predict absolute fitness and therefore aid us to develop demographic models into the forecasting models that we saw previously. Finally, I want to ask what phenotypes are selected in the field. In our field experiments, it was difficult to measure multiple phenotypes. Luckily, there is a lot of published phenotypes from the Arabidopsis community. So with a grad student, Will, we gathered almost 2,000 phenotypes and classified them in the three classic drought strategy types. Avoidance, when a plant tries to increase water availability or efficiency, use efficiency, escape with it when a plant flowers early to uh, avoid a drought that is coming, or tolerance when uh, the plant stabilizes the cells or tissues to endure drought. So by conducting genome-wide associations in all these traits, we can study the effects of alleles on multiple phenotypes and then compare those effects with the selection coefficients in our field experiment. And this is an example with two phenotypes. In this plot, you can see the contribution of 10,000 alleles along the genome to alleles avoidance, so that is higher water use efficiency, or allele escape, earlier flowering. And we see a pretty strong ne negative correlation, indicating that when an allele increases avoidance, it necessarily decreases the escape strategy. And interestingly, we found that alleles selected in Spain and low rainfall were more likely to also increase water use efficiency in these other experiments and likely delay flowering, even though we know that this in the field increased mortality. So this highlights that there are adaptive constraints between maximizing avoidance and escape. So now we're exploring the 2000 traits for this constraint, as we think that this will be an important limitation or important concepts to try to understand what will be the future limitations in adaptation uh, in these forecasting models. So with that, I want to thank all my collaborators and my team, all of you for your attention and the organizers for this fantastic symposium. Thank you.